My name is Jason Roberts. I'm from the University of Queensland, the Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital in Queensland, Australia. And it's a very exciting day for us as part of our education series for our Centre of Research Excellence. We have a very exciting topic today with two fantastic international speakers who come to us from North America. It promises to be a truly fascinating debate, which I hope we'll all learn a lot from. Firstly, I'd just like to thank the sponsors of our education program uh, who have made this possible and for all of our uh, educational uh, events that we are able to hold. So thank you to Pfizer, Gilead Sciences, Baxter Compounding and the University Hospital in Nimes, France. So the topic for this debate relates to precision antimicrobial dosing and is it worth the effort? Uh, and the whole idea of this debate stemmed from an excellent article that was written by Sarah Jorgensen and some of her colleagues. Uh, Dr. Jorgensen uh, is um, a, a real innovator in, in, in thinking about some of these areas. And it's great to have her uh, present the, the con perspective today, uh, which relates to an article that she published in the Journal of Antimicrobials in recent months. Now, I really feel this was a very useful perspective. And I think that's one that we should all be thinking about about what considerations are at play when making decisions for pro providing interventions uh, such as uh, precision dosing, which may be above and beyond what the usual approach is to uh, dose choices. And so I really did see some good value about an intellectual discussion here on this. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, not only is this relevant to our part of the world, but also to other parts of the world too. So I think that it's great to have Sarah involved, but it's also great to have Dr. Ryan Crass involved too. Uh, Ryan is a, a fantastic PharmD from the US. He, I've been fortunate enough to work with him in the past and I've been super impressed with him. Uh, he's got a very, very good mind when it comes to the, the clinical role of optimised dosing of antimicrobials and has a very strong pharmacometric uh, bent, which underpins all of his knowledge of the area. So, you know, we're very lucky. We've got two excellent speakers and they're going to provide very nice perspectives. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we'll both be very grateful for their points of view that they provide. So the format for uh, today is that the pro will be Ryan Crass. He will speak first uh, and that will go for about 20 minutes. And then Sarah will present her con for the subsequent 20 minutes. Each of them will have a five minute rebuttal period after that as well. For some clarity, we ran a poll on Twitter overnight to ask people what they thought about the role of precision dosing for people with severe infections and whether or not the evidence that currently exists supports this approach to therapy. So I think this wording of this for that question is quite poignant, whether or not the evidence supports it. Uh, and what we observed is that 73 votes uh, were cast because we only gave it uh, 12 to 18 hours. And 55% of people thought that yes, it is worth the effort and it is justified based on the evidence. 45% thought no. Uh, and so this provides us with a very interesting backdrop to this debate. So I'll now hand over controls to, to Ryan presenting the pro perspective on whether precision dosing is worth the effort. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so thank you to Jason and, and all the organizers and sponsors of uh, this debate today. Um, I'm honored to be thought of as uh, someone to present the, the pro position here for precision dosing and hopefully make the case that it is in fact worth the effort. Um, just as a brief manner of housekeeping before we get started here, um, I am an employee of Ann Arbor Pharmacometrics Group, um, which does provide pharmacometric consulting services to the pharmaceutical industry. However, I have no um, specific disclosures related to the content of this presentation or any of the sponsors of this meeting. And I wanted to start my talk off by uh, focusing on the more mechanistic framework for precision and microbial dosing. And this is based on the dose exposure response relationship. Um, and I wanted to start off this discussion about exposure response analyses and documenting an exposure response relationship um, by looking at guidance from the United States Food and Drug Administration. Um, unfortunately, this guidance document is um, a little bit dated, uh, last updated in 2003, um, but I think it still gives a good perspective on how regulators view exposure response information in the context of approval of uh, new drugs. And this guidance states that exposure response information is at the heart of any determination of the safety and effectiveness of drugs. 
That is, a drug can only be determined to be safe and effective when the relationship of beneficial and adverse effects to a defined exposure are known. And stated more simply, exposure response is the fundamental assumption underlying all pharmacotherapy. Um, and additionally, exposure response analyses are an integral part and increasingly important in regulatory assessment and approval of new drugs. Um, this, this guidance includes some interesting points of view from the agency on how they view exposure response, but essentially a well-controlled um, exposure response study or analysis can provide substantial evidence of effectiveness of a drug. It can add to the weight of evidence supporting efficacy, um, especially where mechanism of action is well understood, which is certainly the case for antimicrobials. And also probably more relevant to this discussion, it can uh, support or in some cases provide primary evidence for approval of different dosage, dosing regimens, dosage forms, et cetera, which is really how we're leveraging exposure response information clinically to really tailor um, dosing to patients following a precision dosing approach, and in some cases using outside of label approved dosing. Um, and so precision dosing is informed by the exposure response continuum. And this starts with dose, which is our um, most coarse measure of individual exposure. Dose is of course at best a poor surrogate for exposure in individuals in the population. Um, and when we talk about exposure, we're thinking about the, the concentration time profile or potentially derived exposure metrics from this profile, such as AUC, Cmax, and Cmin. And the way that we quantitatively describe the link between dose and exposure is through population PK modeling. Um, these models quantify the uh, population level uh, exposure achieved at a given dose. And you can think of this as the central tendency in the population or the, the mean profile here in the, the solid blue line. And it also quantifies variability that uh, individuals may have around the central tendency, which is included in this figure as the, the prediction interval in shaded blue, which represents the exposure ranges for 90% of the population. And then we can further link exposure to response. And presumably the response to drugs is, is related to the exposure achieved in individual patients. And when we think about exposure response, here I have again defined it just based on uh, concentration on the x-axis to correspond to our uh, exposure figure. But this could also again be an exposure metric such as AUC. But when we look at exposure response, we're again thinking about the population level um, relationship between exposure and good clinical outcomes, which here we're thinking of as the clinical response in green, and also concerns for safety, which is the adverse event curve um, in red. And again, just like for population PK, we can also use population exposure response information to link individual exposures to individual responses and quantify that population central tendency and variability. And then what we're really interested in defining is what's depicted in this shaded gray area, which is representative of the therapeutic range or therapeutic index, or the area in which there is a lot of separation, the range of exposures in which there's separation between the efficacy response and the safety response. And so precision dosing approaches are tools that we can use to help maximize the probability of good outcomes in individual patients. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion in which we are leveraging a lot of information from population models. And so people think of these as referring to population only predictions, um, but these models also give us a lot of information to apply to individuals. But as we look along this continuum of um, increasingly precise dosing on the far left side, um, or very imprecise approach, we have the one size fits all fixed dosing. And this is where the dose that was representative of the primary population in registrational clinical trials is used as the dose for all patients. Um, moving one level from that are population level dose adjustments. Um, and these dose adjustments are based on um, information of individual patient factors, which we term covariates, and how those influence the population central tendency of response. So a good example of these are uh, dose adjustments for eliminating organ function, um, most commonly for antimicrobials being estimation, estimators of renal function, as well as body size. And you can see now in that upper right figure, um, there's now two exposure profiles, um, a prediction in blue for an individual with creatinine clearance of 100 mils per minute, 
and then the prediction in red for an individual with renal impairment and creatinine clearance of 30 mils per minute. And so these um, adjustments are based on kind of exposure matching and shifting that population central tendency or bringing that, adjusting the dose to bring that solid red line down to where the blue line lives. But we can see that the shaded regions still overlap considerably. And so there's a lot of remaining uncertainty about an individual's profile, even after accounting for renal function and body size. And so this is what brings us to individual level dose adjustments, which are based on observed concentration or exposure data, which we think of as therapeutic drug monitoring, um, and the ability to estimate individual PK parameters, in some cases, response parameters to adjust doses. And so I think that it's important to remember that, um, you know, renal dose adjustments that are included in our drug labels and that we commonly perform um, as clinicians on a daily basis are a form of precision dosing. Um, in this case, you have some fixed dose input that goes into um, your population PK model along with the associated concentration time data. And you run a covariate analysis in which you find that estimated renal function um, is a significant covariate of individual exposure. And, and so this again gives us these kind of two simulated profiles um, for an individual with good renal function and one with renal impairment. And our renal adjusted dose again comes from trying to bring these profiles on top of each other, essentially exposure matching. But this is really limited to inference about the population prediction. Um, However, this is still a very common approach used in terms of dose individualization. Another thing that's important to point out is that our renal function estimators are, are actually not incredibly precise. Um, at the best case scenario, um, we have an 80% probability of being within 30% of the true GFR for these patients. Um, and additionally, despite the imprecision in the GFR estimates, there's also uh, a lot of variation between individuals in terms of clearance values for these drugs um, at a given GFR. And so this is a figure I like to point people to um, from the FDA review of meropenem baber bactam which shows the individual meropenem clearance values compared to GFR, with the blue line uh, being the essentially model predicted equation and all the data points representing individual variation. And so you can see a large degree of remaining variability. And so I think what's important to take away from this is that uh, renal dose adjustments are not based on benefit demonstrated in adequately powered arms of randomized controlled trials. Um, these are generally informed by exposure response information from small subgroups and pooled analyses in terms of models. Um, we also don't have a precise, and when I say precise, I mean low variability estimate of individual renal function. And additionally, we don't have a precise estimate of the relationship between individual renal function and drug exposure. So I think potentially um, making an analogy to the case for conservative pharmacotherapy that's been made in, in terms of therapeutic drug monitoring, you could levy the same arguments against renal dose adjustments and say that perhaps we should abandon renally adjusting doses because we don't have um, adequate arms from randomized controlled trials of these doses in these populations. We don't have a very precise estimate of function and a not a strong link between um, renal function and drug clearance. However, I think when we shift to a precision dosing mindset, we think about how can we leverage the information that we obtain from individuals um, and these models to improve the dosing in individual patients. And this is how can we um, improve the precision of dosing in individuals through therapeutic drug monitoring. And so I want to shift from kind of establishing that mechanistic framework supporting um, precision dosing approaches to looking at evidence and support for specific antibiotics. And primarily when we're talking about therapeutic drug monitoring, um, we're using this as a strategy to improve safety without compromising efficacy. And I think it's important to differentiate between our two kind of classical cases, the narrow therapeutic index drug and the wide therapeutic index drug. Um, our classical examples of narrow therapeutic index um, antibiotics are the aminoglycosides and vancomycin. Um, I'm sure cases could be made for others, um, and I know uh, Federico Pia and his group would probably suggest linazolid would fit in there as well, but these are our classical examples. And in order to maximize individual response um, for narrow therapeutic index drugs, again, corresponding to these exposure response curves in the top figure, um, we want to individualize dosing to maintain exposure within this narrow therapeutic range. 
And in general, TDM is going to be required to do this reliably. If we can't account for variability with um, patient covariates or individual intrinsic factors of patients, or if we don't have a good early clinical indicator of toxicity, a very sensitive biomarker that can allow us to adjust dosing or adapt dosing before irreversible toxicity occurs. On the flip side, our classical example of wide therapeutic antibiotics are beta-lactams. In the case of wide therapeutic index drugs, um, you really see that your therapeutic range is very large. There's not a very sensitive exposure response relationship for adverse events. And so generally in these cases, you may not need TDM in the majority of patients unless there is some safety concern identified that shifts that exposure response left for safety. And in general, our approach to precision dosing for wide therapeutic index drugs is gonna to be to give maximal doses um, in a way that optimizes their PKPD. So I'm sure for this audience, I don't need to go in detail about um, acute kidney injury, which is the primary preventable adverse effect that we're trying to avoid through uh, precision dosing approaches, at least with our narrow therapeutic index antibiotics. Um, this is of course a very prevalent comorbidity among hospitalized adults and children. Um, it does have a significant impact on patient outcomes in terms of length of stay, costs, and risks of long-term sequelae. Um, and again, we, we don't have a good biomarker that's used widely clinically to detect um, early evidence of renal injury. And we know that serum creatinine lags behind um, injury and the fact that we have a significant amount of functional nephron loss before we see these increases in serum creatinine. And so, again, it, the... Um, implementation of therapeutic drug monitoring depends on establishing an exposure response. And so there have been multiple studies done, primarily observational in nature, um, to evaluate different um, threshold exposure metrics to predict efficacy and toxicity. And so I've uh, tried to pull um, the pooled odds ratios from these meta-analyses, um, some of the most recently published ones, and look at the relationship between these different potential metrics and the efficacy and safety of vancomycin. And so what we can see here is that for trough concentrations, um, clearly troughs above 15 versus less than 15 have been shown to reduce the odds for treatment failure. Um, additionally, the uh, AUC to MIC above 400 versus less than 400 also has shown this reduction. However, um, there is more uncertainty in our estimate for the effect of um, a trough threshold of 10 milligrams per liter versus less than that threshold. And so although the point estimate is in the direction of reduced risk, um, there's greater uncertainty uh, around this. And so I don't think we have evidence to potentially reduce the trough target um, as a means to reducing the risk of acute kidney injury um, because we're uncertain about what the impact would be on efficacy. And so when we flip the script and look at safety, um, I think we see a very clear relationship um, between all of these um, different thresholds for therapeutic drug monitoring. As you increase trough level, um, you see an increase in the odds ratio for acute kidney injury compared to the reference of the lower trough values. Um, similarly, for AUC to MIC above 600 versus less than 600. When we're looking at the bottom part of this right-hand forest plot, um, here the test and reference conditions are flipped um, from this other meta-analysis that looks at um, specific day AUCs, so day one and day two. And in this case, the test uh, condition is the lower AUC and the referent being the higher value. So you see a reduction in the odds ratio for kidney injury um, with the AUC values below 650. And so I think what we can take away from some of these exposure response meta-analyses is that um, trough concentrations above 10 alone are not predictive of efficacy. And so a potential strategy um, that's not based on AUC to mitigate safety concerns of lowering the trough target um, may not translate to um, sufficient efficacy in patients. Additionally, there have been some studies looking at directly comparing uh, AUC-based monitoring strategies for vancomycin with trough-based monitoring. Um, and these studies actually have been meta-analyzed as well. But if you look at these, the majority of them are um, observational quasi-experimental designs, although notably uh, the study by Mike Neely and colleagues uh, is a prospective pre-registered serial cohort study. And what you'll note it with, uh, as you kind of look at the results across these studies is uh, 
either a, a significant or trend to reduction in acute kidney injury risk with AUC-based monitoring compared to trough-guided therapy. Um, although the meta-analysis odds ratio here for the two TDM approaches, um, the point estimate being a, about a 50% reduction in risk, although um, again, we only have four relatively small studies here, and so our upper end of our confidence interval just barely crosses one. But I think this is very um, suggestive of a beneficial effect of one TDM approach versus the other. Um, I just want to briefly revisit um, our wide therapeutic index antibiotics to not leave them out of the precision dosing discussion completely. Um, but I think, again, for these wide therapeutic index antibiotics, there's been a lot of great work um, done to generate really high quality evidence, um, a lot of it um, from our hosts, uh, Jason Roberts group and out of University of Queensland and really putting together some great studies to demonstrate this benefit. And these have been um, meta-analyzed multiple times. And I think there's clear evidence here that prolonged infusion of, of high doses of beta-lactams optimizes PKPD or at least for critically ill patients and is likely um, a great intervention to improve outcomes in this population. And so I want to finish up by just responding to two of kind of the key criticisms that have, that have been raised about precision dosing and provide some considerations for implementation um, practically and for thinking continuously about these response endpoints. So one of the criticisms levied is that TDM may not be a value added resource um, in the setting of other institutional priorities. And I would push back a little on that and say that for at least narrow therapeutic index antibiotics, this has been the standard of care at many institutions for years, and including um, the two sample peak and trough approach for aminoglycosides. I think that implementation of two sample therapeutic drug monitoring for vancomycin is a relatively modest intervention. Um, and there's at least um, emerging evidence that this can provide um, significant benefit to patients through reduction of AKI. Additionally, I think there are a lot of ways to optimize resource utilization when first implementing AUC-based monitoring. Um, initially, the populations most likely to benefit can be targeted rather than blanket applying this approach to all patients. Some examples of that are those that are gonna be on prolonged um, therapy, such as definitive therapy for MRSA, or maybe empirical therapy for deep-seated infections like bone and joint. Additionally, there are a lot of um, great freely available resources for doing AUC-based therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, I'd like to put a plug in for a, a resource toolkit coming soon from the Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists towards the end of this month, um, which will really provide a whole host of resources for implementing AUC-based monitoring, including a customizable calculator, um, progress note templates, communication tools um, for providers and nursing. And there are also even Bayesian, Bayesian dosing tools that are available um, freely on the web. And so really, Although the guidelines um, mention the Bayesian assistive software approach, it, they're not required to perform this type of monitoring um, in practice. Additionally, I want to point out that trough-only sampling is really insufficient for estimation of AUC or any of our um, pharmacokinetic parameters in an individual that we would need to adjust doses. Um, if we think about what a trough sample represents, it's a single data point. And if we're trying to draw a log linear slope representing KE, through this point, there's an infinite number of potential values. And so unless we have some information about the starting point, um, we don't know which of these values corresponds to our patient. And so that's the, the benefit of this two sample approach is that you can really reduce this infinite number of slopes to the one that's most likely for our patient. Um, trough values really limit you to inference about that single value above or below thresholds and kind of limits your decision-making from therapeutic drug monitoring. One other thing, and maybe a potential myth that I want to um, dispel, at least from my perspective, is that Bayesian dosing software, um, you know, improves the precision of PK parameter estimation, but it doesn't um, obviate the need for two sample um, monitoring approaches. The benefit of these software programs is that they remove some of the assumptions you have to make in clinical calculations. So you don't have to assume one compartment disposition, and you don't have to be either at first dose in which the starting point is zero or an approximate steady state in which superposition applies. The, the advantage of Bayesian software is that you're getting information from a prior population model and also incorporating action, actual dosing history and removing some of those compartmental assumptions. But again, if you don't have that peak value, you're going to have to fall back on the population estimate of volume, which is very similar to doing 
um, an AUC estimation with trough only assuming a volume of 0.7 liters per kilo. And the second criticism that I want to discuss is that, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is still related to the first one, but bringing it back again to our wide therapeutic index antibiotics um, who aren't getting as much time to shine in this presentation. Um, but that I think at this point in time for beta-lactams that therapeutic drug monitoring probably should be limited to research for most patient populations. Um, I think we need to do additional work to quantify the upper end of the exposure threshold uh, in order to target our therapeutic drug monitoring and dosing approaches. I think there's a lot of emerging work on this, especially with cephalosporin-induced neurotoxicities. Um, but that at this point, I think that um, the, the best benefit in terms of precision dosing for beta-lactams uh, is to give the maximal possible doses by a prolonged or continuous infusion. And the second criticism that I wanted to address is that um, TDM is, can be thought of as a replacement for clinical judgment, and it results in kind of unambiguous categorical dis dosing decisions. Um, and I would push back on that and say that TDM should always augment rather than replace clinical judgment. I know at least in my clinical practice, personally, I've never had a TDM scenario that didn't um, require me to, to think critically, especially with two sample monitoring in which you can actually derive individual PK and exposure information rather than just making a categorical trough decision of above or below. Um, TDM results should always be interpreted in the context of patient factors and therapy factors. Um, and again, I hope what I've tried to highlight here is that whenever we're working um, within the dose exposure response framework, we're trying to reduce uncertainty in our individual pharmacotherapy decisions and optimize the probability of a good outcome in those individual patients. Um, additionally, I want to acknowledge that thinking continuously is very hard. Um, and I think one of the limitations to a lot of the existing exposure response work, um, especially with vancomycin, is the tendency to dichotomize exposure um, as above or below some threshold value and to, to use that as a predictor in a multivariable model. Um, I think that exposure response analyses are very powerful and they don't require prospective randomized controlled data. You just need a validated POP-BK model, um, accurate dosing concentration and outcomes data, which is increasingly accessible with electronic health records, and then an adequate sample size, which I think COVID has highlighted that many institutions can um, share data in multi-center collaborations. Um, but we need to use the appropriate data analytic methods to quantify continuous exposure response relationships for clinically relevant outcomes. And these metrics need to be analyzed as continuous variables and the optimal methodology should be able to handle repeated measures within individuals, um, such as kind of the standard nonlinear mixed effects modeling approach. So to summarize, the exposure response relationship is the underlying assumption of all pharmacotherapy. And if you buy into the exposure response relationship, um, and that there is a therapeutic relationship between um, efficacy and safety in terms of separation of these exposure response, then I think precision dosing flows logically from there. Additionally, there's randomized controlled data are not required to quantify this exposure response. Um, therapeutic drug monitoring has been shown to improve the precision of dosing for narrow therapeutic index antibiotics. Um, and this is primarily to reduce um, safety concerns while maintaining efficacy. And then I think for wide therapeutic index antibiotics, in the majority of patients, therapeutic drug monitoring is not necessary and precision dosing approaches um, tailored to optimizing PK, PD through dose and infusion strategy um, are likely most appropriate. Brian, that was a, a really nice uh, description. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd now like to hand over to Sarah Jorgensen, who is from the Department of Pharmacy at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. So this is part of the USA versus Canada epic that we are enjoying today. Sarah. So it looks like I have a, a bit of a tough job trying to um, instill a little bit of skepticism into after uh, my colleague's persuasive presentation, but uh, I think with a little help from the Schitt's Creek crew, I, uh, I have a good chance of that. And, and hopefully you, um, you have this uh, show in Australia. Um, if not, um, hopefully it comes soon because it, it's pretty funny um, and it's Canadian. So, um, but first I want to assure you that I'm, I'm actually not a total contrarian when it comes to precision dosing. Um, I absolutely do not think we should close the book on it. 
Uh, my position is more that we don't have the data to support it right now, but maybe in the not so distant future we will, and, and I do certainly hope so. And so my plan tonight is um, not really to get into the weeds about limitations of particular PKPD studies, but instead we'll look at precision dosing in the broader context of evidence-based medicine. And I'm gonna um, bring in examples from other areas of medicine, kind of with the aim of getting you to draw parallels with um, the precision dosing movement and the quality of evidence currently supporting it. And so um, generally when we think of scientific progress, we think of incremental improvement. So one practice gets supplanted by something better. Uh, but sometimes, especially in medicine, the path forward isn't a straight line. Um, and instead of moving forward, we discover that something we've been doing as a standard of care for years doesn't actually benefit our patients or even worse, sometimes it causes harm. And so medical reversal or evidence reversal is the term that's been coined to describe this phenomenon. Um, Adam Sipu and, and Vinay Prasad have done some really outstanding work in this field. Their book, um, Ending Medical Reversal, really opened my eyes to just how common this problem is, um, with one of their analyses suggesting up to 40% of our routine medical practices will end up being contradicted by future studies. And I think COVID-19 has, has been a real microcosm of this problem. Um, think hydroxychloroquine, convalescent plasma, avoiding steroids, um, to name just a few. And so why does this happen? Uh, one of the most common reasons is overconfidence in a compelling physiological model. So what works in the lab or on a computer or in the head of the smartest researcher doesn't always work in patients. Uh, human physiology and disease are incredibly complex and even our most sophisticated models are kind of crude simplification. And a good example, um, totally outside of ID, is um, drugs for regular heartbeat. So some of you might be old enough to remember back to the 80s and, and early 90s when drugs like flecainide were routinely given to patients after a heart attack. The logic behind this was we thought pretty ironclad. Uh, frequent PVCs are associated with increased cardiac death after a heart attack. And so flecainide and its siblings suppress PVCs. And so giving these drugs to patients with frequent PVCs after a heart attack should prevent death. Um, but when this was properly tested in a large RCT, they found that it led to more death. And physicians were so convinced that these drugs helped that it was actually really hard to get them to enroll patients and, and risk them being randomized to placebo, even though it was the active drug that was causing harm. Another reason uh, being led astray by observational data. So a notorious example is hormone replacement therapy. For years, HRT was prescribed to postmenopausal women based on epidemiological data showing a protective effect against uh, coronary artery disease, fractures and death but observational studies can and often do produce misleading results due to unmeasured confounders. And even the most uh, sophisticated statistical techniques can't really fix this. And when HRT was tested in a RCT, um, they found more coronary artery disease, more thromboembolic events, and more invasive cases of breast cancer in women taking hormone replacement therapy. Um, and so just drilling home the point that you can't hang your head hat on uh, observational studies. This is a really neat analysis done by a group at uh, the University of California, San Diego, looking at the concordance and results from randomized controlled trials and observational analyses of the same questions in oncology. And they found concordance in only 56% of the analyses. Now this improved um, somewhat with multivariable logistic regression and propensity score matching, but still not great. And p-values um, were, co were concordant only 40 to 45% of the time. So this was really no better than, than flipping a coin. That by the way is uh, as a Canadian tuning, if you haven't seen our, our very attractive Canadian coins. Um, and another reason for reversals, so surrogate endpoints, we have a lot of these in infectious disease. 
Um, it wasn't that long ago that combination therapy with an aminoglycoside was a standard of care for Staph aureus bacteremia based largely on in vitro data and clinical trials showing faster sterilization of blood cultures, again, a surrogate endpoint. Um, but we've since learned that this practice doesn't improve heart endpoints like mortality, and it increases the risk of acute kidney injury. Um, another example, so things that look great in the lab can have unintended consequences when we give them to patients. So vancomycin beta lactam synergy against MRSA or the so-called seesaw effect. Um, and there's been some really elegant in vitro and in vivo preclinical studies showing really potent synergy and, and observational studies showing uh, faster sterilization of blood. But again, when this was tested in a properly designed RCT, so the CAMRA-2 trial, the study actually had to be stopped early because of higher acute kidney injury when um, anti-staphylococcal penicillins were added to vancomycin. And I remember when these results were announced at ECMED a few years ago, I, I was absolutely shocked. The preclinical data and observational studies had all seemed so promising. Um, now, now, I think that it's still, um, there's still a possibility that other beta lactams could be more successful and, and safer. And I, I think it's great that the SNAP trial is looking at other combinations because clearly other forms of evidence, so observational studies um, and, and preclinical data, didn't tell the complete story about uh, possible harms. Um, again, we've seen so many times that what works in mice doesn't always work in people. So imagine all the antibiotics that we'd have if, if mouse models translated better. Combinations of antibiotics almost always look great in mice, um, but just one of, of many examples where combinations don't work out in patients. So the ARREST trial with adjuvant rifampin in Staph aureus bacteremia. And last example, so I think this one probably hits home for, um, for a lot of pharmacists, including myself. So trough concentrations of 15 to 20 per serious MRSA infections. So this was, um, this was prompted in part uh, by concerns of the vancomycin MIC creep and associated treatment failures, but without any clinical data to support it as uh, safe or effective. And we've since learned that more vancomycin doesn't improve treatment success, but it does significantly increase the risk of acute kidney injury. And so if we survey what kind of data we have right now to support precision dosing, it's, well, it's exactly the kind of data that has led to so many missteps and medical reversals in the past. And this isn't a criticism of all that research. Um, there's a ton of really incredible PK studies that have um, really shown us how dramatic PK ch changes can be in certain populations. And observational studies are often what provides the hypotheses to support moving forward with RCTs. But that last step is key and implementing things without first testing them in randomized controlled trials is, is really risky business as all of these examples have shown. Okay, so um, now I want to just kind of shift gears a little and talk about one area in particular that I think is a real weakness with precision dosing as it stands now. Um, so if we're measuring drug concentrations, using the results to adjust doses with or without Bayesian uh, modeling software, um, there needs to be a consistent relationship between drug exposure and therapeutic or toxic effect. So the so-called therapeutic range, we need a valid target range. And uh, to illustrate some of the issues with our current therapeutic ranges, um, I thought we'd first look at beta-lactam therapeutic drug monitoring. So there are um, many people advocating for this, particularly in critically ill patients. Um, we know there's a ton of PK variability in these patients, so it makes sense. We should monitor concentrations, tailor doses, help patients. Uh, but what exactly are we shooting for? Uh, this is a, a fairly recent review on beta-lactam and vancomycin precision dosing by uh, Curie LaPlante's group in Providence. And I didn't necessarily agree with their conclusions, but I think that some of their statements were uh, very revealing. And so they argue 
Current beta-lactam therapeutic drug monitoring practices are aimed at achieving 100% free time above MIC or 100% free time above four times the MIC, but then perhaps lower percentage targets, say just 40 to 70% free time above MIC are adequate. Um, and so which one is it? Because that is just an enormous range and, and hardly precise to, to guide dosing. And more broadly, um, I'd argue that the concept of a therapeutic range, at least the way that it's derived and operationalized now, is, is really the antithesis of personalized or precision dosing. Uh, first, most PKPD targets come from animal models. So personalized, but not derived from people. Um, sometimes there are attempts to validate them in patients with, with varied success. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then these are population therapeutic ranges, and it's really easy to imagine that exposure needed to cure an infection is going to vary by the source, the extent of source control. Uh, is this a chronic infection where we have to contend with biofilms? Are we using combination therapy? Um, hugely important is the patient's immune system, uh, comorbidities, some of these might alter blood flow to the site of infection. And then most PKPD targets are expressed using total drug concentration, but we know that for many drugs, there's a lot of variability in, in the free fraction. Um, and so there's just so many factors that aren't captured in, in our so-called target ranges. And uh, I alluded to the, the fact that we've had varied success validating therapeutic targets um, clinically, and the data with vancomycin and AUC, I think really drives this home. So the AUC MIC PKPD target cited over and over again um, is greater than 400. In vitro and animal data, I feel like have been pretty heterogeneous. Um, the 400 target can actually be traced back to a small retrospective study of patients with staph aureus pneumonia, uh, the primary outcome was sterilization of uh, respiratory specimens in mostly mechanically ventilated patients. And I'm not going to dwell on uh, the issues with this study, but suffice to say multiple attempts to validate that 400 threshold uh, using clinical data have all uniformly failed. So it has actually never been validated. And so what we have instead are a ton of studies using clinical data to get new cut points uh, using classification and regression tree analysis or CART. And uh, here are all of the different cut points that have been found by that method. And even when I squint really, really hard, I, I can't make them converge on 400. And the upper limit of 600 for nephrotoxicity, I could show you a similar graph with just as much scatter. And actually the threshold for nephrotoxicity in a a post hoc analysis of the CAMRA 2 study um, was actually 470, so right smack in the middle of the so called therapeutic range. And so, um, anytime that you see a, a threshold value derived using CART analysis, I'd say uh, proceed, proceed with great caution. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with CART, it's, it's basically a statistical method that's used to bisect data based on improvement in homogeneity of a dependent variable. And in doing so, you create these decision trees of various depths. It's used a lot uh, to explore exposure response relationships as well as associations uh, for other biomarkers. But the trouble is because CART tests every data point for a relationship, the chance of type one errors is dramatically increased. And you can see this illustrated nicely here. So um, we've got hypothetical response rates by hypothetical AUC values. So this data was generated totally randomly and, and there's clearly no underlying relationship, but CART finds a split in the AUC at 524. And this is statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.034. Um, now this is just one simulation that I'm showing you, but uh, Bruce Dalton's team has done hundreds of these simulations, all randomly generated hypothetical AUCs and response rates. And CART can find a cut point in every single one of these simulations and half of them were statistically significant. So basically with this method, um, I kind of feel like it's akin to torturing the data and it will uh, confess to, to pretty much anything. 
And now um, the last point about PKPD target. So all the commonly used indices have MIC in the denominator. So think free time above MIC, AUC over MIC, peak over MIC. Um, but it's a very dynamic process that's impacted in vivo by organism metabolic status, uh, growth rate, inoculum, expression levels of virulence factors, uh, resistance determinants, and so on. And, and we also know there is substantial inherent assay variability in the MIC test. And with few exceptions, current methods just don't produce sufficiently accurate or reproducible MIC values. And you can see the variability in staph aureus vancomycin MICs using different methods in the graph shown here. Um, the method-specific variability um, was actually what partly led um, to our concerns about the vancomycin MIC creep and, and the recommendation to target high troughs. Um, so remember MIC, it's expressed as a doubling dilution, so it has an enormous impact on um, the exposures that we need to achieve PKP targets. And finally, that the MIC itself may serve as a confounder for other patient or pathogen-related factors that impact outcomes. So the classic example is uh, patients with high vancomycin MIC methicillin-sensitive staph aureus infections doing worse even when they're treated with beta-lactams. So high MICs often, they just kind of represent badness irrespective of PKPD considerations. And so I feel like we're still blind to what we really need to be shooting for for each patient. So-called target ranges may give false, a false sense of security, um, but only represent uh, the pseudo precision or pseudo uh, personalization. Most aren't validated and, and they do obscure much of the underlying uncertainty in the data that they're loosely based on. And we don't know if achieving these targets actually helps patients or makes the use of our antibiotics safer. Um, and we do have other ways to monitor patients. So think for the vast majority of drugs, we don't measure concentrations in the blood to judge if patients are doing better. Um, the question that really needs to be answered is what can a therapeutic drug monitoring um, result add to this? Now safety, I, I think that that's where I see the most potential. For nephrotoxicity, I agree with Brian that urine output and serum creatinine are insensitive and there's a pretty, um, pretty significant lag. But we need valid toxicity thresholds and we need to prove that adjusting doses based on a therapeutic drug monitoring result actually does reduce toxicity. And, and really the only way to prove this is uh, randomized controlled trials. But there are, um, there are many very smart people who still maintain that randomized controlled trials aren't needed. And I do acknowledge that not everything can or should be tested in a randomized controlled trial. Some medical practices are really like parachutes and it would be ludicrous to test them in RCTs. Um, so if you aren't familiar with this satirical article, it was published in uh, the BMJ Christmas edition. Um, so do give it a read if, if you get a chance, but the authors make the tongue-in-cheek observation that there's no RCT evaluating the effectiveness of parachutes in preventing major trauma, just kind of low-quality observational data and kind of as a placeful jab at evidence-based medicine enthusiasts, they argue individuals who insist all interventions need to be validated by a randomized controlled trial need to come down to earth with a bump. And uh, in the nearly two decades since this uh, was published, the parachute analogy has really become the arch nemesis of, of evidence-based medicine. Um, because most medical practices are, are really not parachutes. I agree we don't need RCTs if the condition without treatment is almost universally fatal. Death, I think it approaches 100% if you jump out of an airplane at, at 10,000 feet without a parachute. And also if the intervention has a huge effect size, a RCT might not be mandatory either. So with a parachute, the risk of death goes from essentially 100% to um, probably less than 0.1%. But these conditions, they're not met for most of the things that we do. 
So think about it, parachutes are so effective because falling from an airplane has one causal pathway to harm, but most human diseases are multifactorial and in one practice is unlikely to single-handedly reverse the outcome. Most medical practices have very modest effect sizes and many more have uncertain benefit and uncertain harms. And precision dosing at this time does have uncertain benefit and, and also uncertain harms. Um, another line of resistance that I hear is that uh, randomized controlled trials, they're just not feasible. And I absolutely acknowledge that it's gonna be far more complicated um, than say testing drug A versus B, but not impossible or out of reach. And, and we do have precedents. Um, so two really well done randomized controlled trials by our oncology colleagues, testing AUC based uh, 5FU versus empirical dosing. Both studies showed lower toxicity with the PK dosing, and then one of the studies also showed improved response rates. And that's pretty huge. I mean, think about all the novel targeted cancer drugs coming onto the market with really hefty price tags that barely improve progression-free survival and, and come with some real tolerability issues. So there's definitely potential for precision dosing. Um, autoimmune diseases, this RT, RCT of uh, therapeutic drug monitoring guided infliximab was published uh, last month in JAMA. No significant difference uh, compared to standard of care, but an important study nonetheless. A lot of resources might have been devoted to this and um, with no tangible benefit to patients. So now at least we know. And in infectious disease, diseases too, so there was a bling two, and now the bling three are uh, randomizing 7,000 patients to intermittent versus prolonged beta lactam infusion. Um, the DOLPHIN trial, so therapeutic drug monitoring for beta lactams and, and fluoroquinolones, and I really can't wait to see the results of this. And uh, so in conclusion, I see no compelling reason standards of evidence for precision dosing should be lowered um, than in other areas of medicine. We know that the lower the standard of evidence we accept for adopting a new practice, the greater the chance for future reversal. Um, a culture based on should work rather than does work is going to be condemned to constantly correct itself. And, and remember that funding and, and support for new interventions is generally accelerated when high quality evidence becomes available. Um, the danger of moving forward based on, on weak evidence is that once something gets ingrained in clinical practice, the adoption is a really long and difficult process. So we've known, I think, for probably almost a decade that vancomycin troughs above 15 are associated with higher rates of acute kidney injury. But until very recently, this practice has persisted. So there's very few interventions that are true parachutes. Um, I think that even the most ardent precision dosing enthusiasts will have to acknowledge that it's not a parachute. Um, benefit is likely to be fairly modest and, and therefore it really does need to prove its value in a randomized controlled trial. And I, I think now is, is the time with the growth of pragmatic uh, adaptive clinical trial designs. So with that, um, I will uh, close it out. And thank you for uh, listening to my little rant about uh, evidence-based medicine. Excellent rant. Thanks, Sarah. That was very nice. Uh, Ryan, five minutes response to, to Sarah's con of uh, precision dosing. Sure. I think that um, there's a lot of good points raised about some of the limitations of um, precision dosing, or at least the evidence basis for it. I think that the assertion that a lot of um, the evidence that we base our decisions on right now is from preclinical systems um, is probably not as true today. I think we have a fair amount of, of human outcomes data supporting at least reduced toxicity in, in the setting of vancomycin therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, I completely agree um, with Dr. Jorgensen's point about um, to stop dichotomizing um, continuous variables. I, I agree with the limitations of CART. Um, I think that yeah. as an analysis methodology, it has limited value for um, determining actionable information from 
uh, exposure response data. And we should really be treating these variables as continuous to best quantify um, these relationships. Um, I think that, you know, the, the practicality of randomized controlled trials for TDM is a, you know, a discussion that we can bring up. I think that, um, Jason, the your group's proven that you can do randomized controlled trials in some of these um, precision dosing areas, um, at least for interventions that are maybe a little simpler, um, such as the beta-lactam infusions. But um, I think that my point that I made about not truly needing a randomized controlled trial to quantify a good exposure response relationship, I still think that's true. If you have um, good enough quality data, which I think we can get from um, electronic health records these days and, and validated PK models, I think we can really develop automatically um, sound exposure response data on which to base these decisions. Um, and I think when we come back to it, everything that we're doing with therapeutic drug monitoring is trying to optimize the, the probability of a good clinical outcome for an individual. And I think it's really difficult for clinicians to, to think about probabilities and continuously, um, and you, you know, um, my colleague brought up kind of all those other clinical variables and factors that we consider when um, determining dose regimens and response. Um, and I think that TDM is just another tool in that. If we know that lower exposures or at least exposures within a certain range appear to be associated with less toxicity, then we're, although our individual patient may still develop toxicity, we're, our data that we have would suggest that we're lowering that probability with our intervention. Um, and I think that the you know what's the alternative the the fallback that um, you know clinical reasoning and clinical factors there's there's not a randomized controlled trial for those things as well um, I think when we're thinking about the relative costs of implementing some of these things I think there are other areas that you could equally target as not having good evidence you know getting daily blood cultures and bacteremia daily labs to monitor white count um, I think there's other intensive monitoring things that we do to patients that have even less value demonstrated than therapeutic drug monitoring. So I just make the case that I think it's the, the best we can do for our patients um, in a lot of cases in order to protect them from um, toxicity. I'll see the floor back to uh, Dr. Jorgensen for her rebuttal. Yeah, thanks. Um... Yeah, I think that we agree on a, a lot, a lot of points, um, and I, I think it's just um, sort of the last point of um, what kind of evidence do you actually need to, to go forward with an intervention. And I think that the rationale behind precision dosing is sound, um, but there have been, as I um, as I kind of went over in the beginning of the presentation, a, a lot of interventions that that have very sound rationale and, and very good preclinical data. And, and they don't always pan out as, as we'd expect um, because there's just so much more complexity than, than, um, than we're able to, to model or, or capture. Um, and, and I would also say in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the clinical data supporting uh, precision dosing or therapeutic ranges, I, I would just, Go back to that. It that it is. Um, it is all observational, um, and, and so influenced by confounders. And I, and I think that um, you know we really saw that with with the vancomycin MICs when um, it it first appeared that higher MICs were driving treatment failures. And, and later we learned that um, that it was a lot more complicated, and that some of that might be due to prognostic factors of of patients who get infected with those higher MIC isolates. So um, I guess I would I would still caution against moving forward with complex interventions and until you um, until we have better supporting data. And, and I agree that there's so many things that, that we do without good data, but I don't think we want to add one more thing. Um, right now, you know, a lot of things that we are doing are being questioned, choosing wisely and and uh, looking at low value interventions. So I, I think that the fact that, um, that there's a lot we do without supporting evidence doesn't, doesn't really justify add, adding one more thing to it. Thanks very much, Dr. Ryan Krauss, Dr. Sarah Jorgensen. That was a, a really enjoyable discussion uh, that you both had. Uh, I've got lots of things that I'd like to say, but it's uh, not for me to do so. Uh, but I just want to compliment you both on 
so eloquently putting forth both of your cases. I think what's absolutely clear from both of you is that in healthcare, you want the best for your patients. And uh, everyone has different leanings on a continuum about the best way to provide that care. Uh, but one thing is certain that both of you suggested is that there's a certain level of evidence that you think is important to be established. Now, whether we like it or not, um, precision dosing in its broadest form isn't widely practiced uh, globally at the moment, uh, as much as some of us may believe that there is some true value with it. And I think that that uh, really does mean that for all of us that are uh, listening live and all those that may be listening uh, recorded later on, that this does require us to try and study this in more detail to quantify what the true clinical outcome benefits are uh, and what the, the, the health uh, costs or savings are of these kind of interventions. Uh, you know, I think that it certainly does make a lot of sense, as Sarah was saying, all of Ryan's arguments about that it's, it's really the exposure that's been validated for, for many drugs as opposed to the dose. And you know, that's one of my main queries is that, what about if you're using that dose in a population that hasn't actually been uh, subject to a clinical trial, then you know, you're making an assumption yourself going forward that that dose is going to be appropriate in that population. Of course, that's not uh, necessarily the case. So, uh, you know, there's a lot that can be learned from this. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that we've all got a lot of ideas about how we can take this forward and understand the area a lot more. So thanks very much again to uh, Dr. Crass, Dr. Jorgensen, uh, you know, USA versus Canada, I can't split them. You know, two wonderful countries, two wonderful speakers, uh, two wonderful arguments, and uh, you know, let this be the first of, of many more uh, uh, friendly discussions that we can have for the benefit of, of so many others. Thanks everyone for your attendance today. I thought that was a lot of fun and I uh, look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you.